the same. Too many humans and what we're doing decreases diversity. They will likely do so in a non-random way as specific species are encouraged or eliminated by human action. We're, we have a choice. We're, we're choosing what we're cultivating uh, and we're choosing what wins and what doesn't win. And in the 21st century, uh, that is in essence uh, what we have to battle. I can't believe that uh, I'm standing in the Arnold R. Readham to give a lecture. I, could, I would not have thought that uh, when I was an undergraduate. This is really an, an, an amazing place uh, here at the, Na at the National R. Readham, here at the Arnold R. Readham, uh, to think that uh, you'll celebrate 150 years uh, soon. Uh, and really, in the world of horticulture, this place really is a mecca. Uh, not just horticulture, but botany uh, and plant sciences. And what's really exciting, though, is the future. So talking with Ned, talking with Michael about where uh, the Arnold R. Reedham is going to go in the next 150 years uh, is really inspiring and really makes me think about what we need to be doing at the National R. Reedham when I'm not overwhelmed with being the director of the National R. Reedham. I'm not a musician. I'm not a, a literary person either. I thought that the leitmotif was an interesting term about a reoccurring theme. And in our gardens, plants are obviously a reoccurring theme. And when we think about it, I have a background in design. We often think about what plants can do for the garden design and the experience, uh, the repetition, uh, how you can direct the eye, the form, and the function. And uh, for me, I think about plant diversity. From day one, I was sort of trained by a lot of great plant people in the world. Uh, this was a, a, an old slide of mine that I took at Heronswood Gardens. And Heronswood Garden was the leader in sort of plant exploration in the commercial realm. Uh, and from the late 80s and to the 1990s. Anyone ever heard of Heronswood out in um, Seattle or out on the Olympic Peninsula? Uh, but uh, really an amazing place to learn about plants. And if you ever, as a horticulturist in the southern United States, you read a lot of garden books and then sort of the first thing you learn about is don't trust the garden books because most of them are based on the English or the New English garden experience. Uh, when you're gardening in the south, uh, you don't get to see the primulas like you read about. Uh, and so going out to New England was sort of my first exposure to that. And some gardens uh, do plant form better than others, uh, but this is sort of our, our white Anglo-Saxon Protestant heritage, more or less, is uh, the way that we have traditionally used uh, plants in the gardens for emphasis and uh, form and function. Uh, and uh, when I was thinking about plant diversity, there are some gardens that do it really well. I, I was down at North Carolina State in the 90s with a professor, Dr. J.C. Ralston, who uh, was one time asked, well, why don't you grow the Arboretum? You're only eight acres. You could do so much more. And his response was, one of the greatest gardens on the planet was only eight acres. And this is Sissinghurst uh, in England. Uh, and this is, uh, I knew I was a geek at the time. I was carrying a camera around, taking slides, and thought if I was ever going to uh, teach uh, horticulture, or heaven forbid, be the director of a garden, I'd better have a lot of slides, because they always carried slide carousels everywhere. And of course, that digital technology caught up to us. Uh, and scans do, slides do not last as long as people think they last, uh, even when they're stored well. But this is Sissinghurst, which is an amazing garden that really combines everything we talk about in terms of the garden experience and diversity. This is what we kind of want uh, in terms of our landscapes. And, and I'll preface this a little bit later about the National Arboretum, but I guess I should say right now that National Arboretum, um, we really exist to uh, in, enhance uh, the economic, aesthetic, and ornamental values or environmental values of American landscapes and landscape plants. And so we have a very applied um, tech transfer approach to the National Arboretum. So our goal is to solve problems for American agriculture, which horticulture in the nursery industry is one segment. It's a $20 billion segment, actually $200 billion uh, total economic benefits. And so it's a huge part of American agriculture for a good portion of, of some of our states. Uh, and that's what we do the National Arboretum. We have the collections uh, and we do the basic science, but at the end of the day, we're trying to improve the American landscape. Uh, and this is a garden in uh, Swarthmore, uh, Pennsylvania, which is a great horticultural mecca. And that's kind of what we want. You got your green meatballs, it's kind of a necessity, right? Boxwood, everyone knows boxwood. But those two trees are not just your typical uh, crab apple or crepe myrtle if you're in the south. That's a Frank, those are Franklinia. So right here, uh, in front of this house, flanking that, is uh, one of our greatest, uh, actually uh, extinct in the wild trees, the, the Ben Franklin tree, Franklinia. And so that, I can live with that landscape. And of course, I'm sure uh, Ned and others have probably talked about the virtues of Franklinia, and we'll talk about it in, in a little bit later. But this is often what you see in American landscapes. This is where I grew up in North Carolina, and uh, there's about three species of plant there, uh, at least three planted on purpose. 
uh, and we can do a, a lot more in terms of the diversity of our landscapes. And you see now, especially uh, with the, the advent of ecos recognition of ecosystem services, functions of our landscapes, what are you doing for the larger ecosystems and habitats, uh, that, that's pretty much kind of a dead zone, right? And so uh, how, did we, how did we get this way? And I always think about context when we talk about diversity and where we are in, in our gardening uh, heritage. It used to be gardens were tiny enclaves in a vast wilderness. This is where we started. This is a historical photo uh, of a Pennsylvania farmstead. And we were literally carving out of a wilderness and we were pushing the native plants back. We were pushing everything out. Uh, for, you know, for millennia, humans were pushing things out, right? Uh, because of safety. Uh, and circumstances have changed a lot over the years. And so this was what we all learned when we learned American history, right? Was manifest destiny. Uh, it was our right to take over the continent. Uh, and, and we certainly uh, left the spoiled, limited uh, wilderness in its place, right? And so we're sort of recovering from this ecological imprint. And, and so for folks like me, uh, uh, growing up in horticulture and learning about all the, the great plant explorers and what it looked like 250 years, 300 years ago, this is uh, when I was a grad student and you had no money, um, uh, what I did was I would botanize on the weekends. And so in the South, we were blessed because uh, so many of the great plant explorers were, uh, went through the southeastern United States, like William Bartram. Uh, and so you could follow his trail. Uh, and Andre Michaud uh, the, uh, and the Michaud father and son team as they went around the United States collecting this immense and really cool diverse flora that was in the New World. Uh, but the reality is this is what uh, those sites sort of look like uh, today, right? And, that's quite telling about what uh, we're dealing with in the 21st century uh, and as botanical gardens that have any role in, in conservation of plant diversity, um, uh, this is what we're up against. Uh, and this was, I live in Washington, D.C. and this was the new homes that were going up in 2007 when I moved up there. So this was the new home directory for a, a vast swath of northern Virginia. Uh, and of course the 2008 recession slowed it a little bit but we're still dealing with this, urban sprawl, and um, so more landscapes. And so what does that mean for diversity in the 21st century? What is our role as a botanical garden uh, or as horticulturists? And um, I guess this is where Ned should chime in uh, and talk about as the early angiosperms were evolving out of the, the ooze and muck uh, and here uh, and, and delivering sort of uh, producing this great diversity of uh, flowering plants that we enjoy. Um, you know, what, what do we have in our gardens? This is my garden, by the way. This is more of just a, uh, about who I am here in the first uh, 15 minutes. And uh, this is my little townhouse garden in, in, in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland. And there's about, I don't know, six or seven plant families there. Um, and, and the big sort of tropical thing is actually a hardy Schefflera, which is in the Araleaceae. So us, we're still in zone seven down there, so we get to talk about a lot more broadleaf evergreens than you do. Um, but nonetheless, uh, there's hops growing up my front porch too, uh, by the way, which uh, uh, we use the, to uh, make our own beer. But, uh, and again, the diversity of forms uh, of plants that we need in our landscape. And, and of course, now I have procreated uh, as a young adult, and this is my first successful hybrid. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and being at an arboretum, you think about how you connect uh, the next generation to what we do. Uh, and we don't have the charismatic megafauna of the zoos. We don't have the pandas and elephants. But we do have things like giant Japanese butterbur, Pedicides japonicus gigantea. And, and, and again, what four-year-old wouldn't think that was really cool? And you don't know how that's touched him uh, for a lifelong. I'm not saying he should be a horticulturist, but you never know where these things, when they have connections with nature, uh, where they're going to come back. Uh, and, you know, they don't, he doesn't really care that it's a, an interesting member of the Asteraceae, the, the sunflower family. Most of you look at those flowers or the fruit, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that. Uh, you can go right out here and see uh, its dwarf cousin and, and, and hybrid out here on um, your creek out here. But I wouldn't plant it in my garden. I have it in a giant tub because it will run like bamboo. But it's a, it's a pretty amazing plant. So, so we enjoy the collections on different levels. Gavin doesn't care that it's in the Asteraceae. He doesn't care that it's an interesting uh, winter flowering annual, or I mean perennial. Uh, but maybe it encouraged him to do like what I did, which uh, this is in the Andes. Uh, when I uh, defended my PhD, my wife surprised me with a um, two-week trip to uh, the Galapagos uh, as a reward. 
Uh, and uh, that's kind of hard to top <laughs> for a, a plant biologist. But uh, one of the things we did when we were there, we were in Quito and we were looking out at, uh, in the Andes at you know, 15,000 feet. And then lo and behold, you're seeing another member of the Asteraceae. So it's amazing to think about how all of these plants exist and have evolved and how they're related as these cushion plants and, uh, and how you get connected. This is my friend Dan Hinckley. And again, it doesn't have to be strange places around the world. It can be right in your own backyard. This is in North Carolina where I grew up. And this is at Pisgah National Forest. And those are just giant cinnamon ferns, just regular old cinnamon fern. Uh, and he, Dan Hinckley has been around the world, literally every continent. Um, I'm not sure he's been to Antarctica yet, but uh, not much to collect plant-wise there. Um, but he has been around, and he is just as tickled there um, as anywhere else. And this has been going on a long time, if we're in humans. We've been interested and been using plant diversity uh, for, uh, since we've pretty much uh, learn to use tools, I guess. And uh, this is the famous, when you're into plant exploration and plant geeks, you, you learn about, you know, Queen Hapshut and the expedition to the land of Punt to collect uh, frankincense, or this in case, uh, this was myrrh. Uh, and so that was the world's first plant exploration trip right there. Uh, uh, who knows if it was, but that's what was documented, right? So we like to talk about this has been going on for uh, several thousand years. Uh, and why do we do that? Well, Plants have value, uh, and in this particular case, uh, I stole this image from National Geographic, uh, uh, myrrh is, uh, and frankincense are, have been used forever, uh, almost, uh, since the time of the Egyptians and before, as uh, resins uh, and for ceremonies and for medicines. Unfortunately, uh, we still have over-exploitation of these resources, and so bad news for Christmas, frankincense faces uncertain future. Uh, it's a bulbous, uh, uh, it's an interesting uh, biology, but it has a bulbous trunk for water storage and it, it grows out of rock faces. It sort of wedges itself in and, and sort of attaches itself. Uh, and uh, it grows in arid climates in the Horn of Africa, so Yemen, Somalia, uh, and then several species into Saudi or, or the Arabian Peninsula. But it's being, you basically have to tap it uh, and essentially kill it, slowly kill it to, uh, to get the resins, the sap. That issue is how do you tell someone who has no other source of income in that part of the world that you can't do this or you shouldn't do this? Uh, and so it's not an easy conversation when they have no other economic means to support their families. And so plant conservation in situ is not, um, is not always um, going to occur. And we can't uh, sort of impose our uh, Western ideas on that. And then this is the habitat, which is, uh, this is the species that grows in uh, of the Arabian Peninsula, and you can see how harsh it is. But there's very few individuals left uh, because of overexploitation, and that's very sad to think about. We've been doing this for three, four thousand years, and now we've 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 maxed it out. Uh, and so, how do we deal with that? And, and as a plant biologist, as someone that loves plants, you 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 start putting two and two together. Those the frankincense and myrrh are in the same family, the Bursaceae. But this is actually the Galapagos, and this is Bursera malacophylla. This is a Bursera forest, and guess what? That's Palo Santo, that's the Spanish. So you have these taxonomic relationships and medicinal relationships. It's like a no-brainer, right? Well, if they have the same constituents in this part of the family, it may have the same ones. And so it's a very, um, and, and, and so uh, why we have used these plants for thousands of years, uh, we're now understanding that they're actually related. And that tells us a lot of information uh, about how and what we need to be looking at as we move forward. I just show these because Galapagos is really cool. How many people have ever been to the Galapagos? Okay, a handful. It's, you don't want to be, uh, to, to simplify it to the fact that it has value because it's useful to man. Um, but the reality is, is that's where a lot of value is derived. And as we go into the 21st century, um, we're going to have to be making harsh decisions about what we can and can't do. This is uh, Gossopium dar darwinii, or uh, the, uh, Darwin's uh, uh, cotton. It's a cotton from the Galapagos Islands, which has been used in salt tolerance and breeding work. So again, a lot of people wouldn't care that it was from the Galapagos, but the researchers cared because it had salt tolerance that you could confer to cotton species. Same thing, and then same thing with this plant, like a Persican cheese manii or Selenum cheese manii, which is basically the Galapagos turtle. Uh, turtle. There's a turtle in the background. Um, uh, the Galapagos uh, is uh, one of the species of tomatoes uh, native to the Galapagos Islands uh, in South America, and so. Uh, again, this species has been very important in salt tolerance work and, and cultivated tomato. 
Well, it's really important too for these habitats and ecosystems where it's native, so it has that value. But um, at the end, we, we're, we're asking ourselves, how do we save everything and all those connections? That's pretty daunting. So, uh, and this is interesting. I almost mentioned this at dinner today because this is an interesting story. So we talk about what we're conserving and plant diversity and maybe how we should conserve this. Well, it was, uh, with all these new molecular tools, we can, we can do things that we maybe never thought we could do before. And so it turns out that one of the species of turtle that was native to the Galapagos was not really extinct. If you consider that it had hybridized with one of the other turtles. And it was uh, shown through the molecular work to be an F1 hybrid, which means a first generation cross. So theoretically then, there are genes uh, from that turtle that are not gone, that turtle species. And so what if you could select back uh, and select back for the missing turtle? We, we do this all the time uh, in breeding animals. Uh, so why couldn't we sort of se select backwards? And it's an interesting question. Uh, the turtles are obviously important on Galapagos. This is an, a, a puncha, a uh, prickly pear. Whoever knew there'd be a tree species of prickly pear? And uh, so they're really important. But when I went to visit, and then I asked myself as we were at the airport, and I had some food, and one of the finches flew up, was, is my presence really is altering something? I obviously flew here, and there's a carbon cost of me flying here. But here we have the famous Dar Darwin's finches uh, from the Galapagos, and I'm feeding it. And what is the repercussion of, of that and all that activity? And how do we account for all that? Darwin was an incredible person. What I like about him was he was such an observer. And this is an unpublished note from his, uh, his diary, which I really love, when he sort of talked about sort of this uh, family tree concept. Uh, and at the very top of it, you'll notice it says, I think. What an incredible statement for a scientist. Uh, he had an idea, and he just simply said, I think. If I ever get a tattoo, that, uh, that is what it's going to be. And I, I like Darwin a lot. I'm not nearly a scholar like Ned. Uh, but this is at the Missouri Botanical Garden. I just had to show this uh, because that is, I'm holding in the upper right corner, a first edition, first printing of The Origin of Species, uh, which I think there was only 250 made uh, printed because they kind of didn't know how that was going to go uh, back then uh, and then some of the early drawings. But, um, he was on to something, diversity was cool, and how diversity works in, in the evolution of plants and animals. Uh, and I always like this, I was at a, a trade conference in uh, Europe in 2007, and the Chileans were there, and they said, Chilean, Chilean plants, enjoy them like Charles Darwin did. So uh, I think we all should, those are the famous orcarias and monkey puzzles. But when you think about humans in the 21st century and where we, where we have gone and what we're doing, this is, this is sort of the image that I think about, which, uh, I um, um, sort of modified from an article in Science Magazine in 2007 that was written by a consortium of scientists that represented a lot of the conservation agencies um, and a lot of agricultural scientists and other people that normally don't talk to, about uh, together or write papers together. And they talked about the crisis in the 21st century. And this is uh, one of the, what they talked about was a domesticated nature, that we have to understand the fact that um, we have done things to native populations that could have been done on a time scale before us that are still reverberating through. They're still working through the repercussions. Uh, and those things are actually changing all the time. But if you look at it, if anthropogenic change decreases diversity, that's what we've been saying. Too many humans and what we're doing decreases diversity. It will likely do so in a non-random way as specific species are encouraged or eliminated by human action. We're, we have a choice. We're, we're choosing what we're cultivating, uh, and we're choosing what wins and what doesn't win. And in the 21st century, uh, that is, in essence, uh, what we have to battle. So our challenge is to understand and thoughtfully manage the trade-offs among ecosystem services that result from the inescapable domestication of nature. Now, that sounds like a doomsday uh, saying, but it's really a call to arms to understand that plant diversity and our botanical gardens and our reader are more important than ever before uh, because there are going to be trade-offs in the 21st century. Uh, and uh, the botanical gardens have to be front and center with domestication. And this is already being done. I posed that question before with um, the Galapagos turtle and whether or not you could reselect for the missing species. Well, they're doing it in Europe. If they're going to restore some of the European grasslands in Europe, you kind of need the large mega herbivore that maintained that habitat. 
If you're not maintaining that habitat in any other mean, in other uh, any ways, it's futile to introduce the plants that were there if you can't manage the habitat. And so what they're doing is they're actually backbreeding to restore aurochs, which was the wild cattle ancestor. Uh, the last one I think died in, in, a, in a Prussian zoo in the 1800s or something, late 1800s. And so what they found with genetic tools was that a lot of these heirloom breeds like the Skylish Highland cattle are not that far removed from what an auroch was. And so you can have a breeding program that selects for auroch-like traits. Now I'm not saying, they're not saying they're going to introduce the auroch, but they're going to introduce an auroch-like animal. And so that's what we have to understand with what is missing in that ecosystem and what can we provide. And so it's one thing to have the plants, it's another thing to have animals. So this is uh, just the, something to think about. And so when we think about southeastern United States or eastern United States, we have to think about what's missing. It's interesting as a thought exercise. Carolina parakeet, I'm from North Carolina, used to be millions of these um, fed in the coastal plain, actually fed up and down uh, the eastern United States. Um, it's thought to be one of the, 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 the distributors of burdock. Uh, Xanthonium, and there it is feeding on burdock. But so what was it that it fed and helped distribute that it's no longer doing? Uh, because it's not there. Same thing with the passenger pigeon. Last one died in a zoo uh, in the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and what, did it, what was its effect on masting species of oak? So when we talk about oak ecology and all, you ever wonder why there are small oaks, acorn species of oaks and large acorn species of oaks? Think about it in the context of the passenger pigeon that would, would swarm through in the millions and clean out all of those acorns. And so think about the evolutionary strategies. And so what does that mean? when we talk about uh, restoring things. Here is an Audubon print with uh, the passenger pigeon and one of my favorite plants, which I forgot to stick an image of, which is Stewardia malacodendron. So one of our native Stewardia. Uh, Arnold Arboretum has a great collection of Stewardia, which is in the tea family. And so now we're finally into the talk. Are you guys ready? <laughs> uh, and so there's Frank Linnea, one of my early slides. Apologize for the, the state of it. But uh, in the Camellia family, uh, named after Ben Franklin, you probably all know the story last seen in the wild sometime around the turn of the 19th century. Uh, I like to call this one of those plants that literally we caught as it was about to be snuffed out. I really don't think there was any conspiracy theory on, on the rise of cotton farming or deforestation or anything. We just have to accept that I really think in this particular case that population was essentially gone and uh, the Bartrams found it uh, and, and named it and then uh, we got some seed of it. So. Uh, I think this one was, uh, was on its way out. And it only exists as a conservation species. That's a true conservation species. It does not exist in the wild. It only exists in cultivation. Uh, and the reason we've cultivated it, to be frank, is because it's beautiful. If it was ugly, it would have been gone a long time ago. If it had no value, it would have been gone. So when we talk about the choices we've made, this is one of those choices. So, uh, and we've made it not because uh, early on in the 1800s, uh, we thought it was going extinct, but because it was a beautiful tree. Uh, and again, what do we do with these genetics uh, for a species like Franklinia that doesn't exist except for in cultivation? Is it the only way to keep it is keep it from breeding? What if, we, if something happened to Franklinia and a horrible disease that was wiping it out, but maybe one of its relatives was resistant? Would it behoove us to cross that? with one of its close relatives so we can keep some semblance of the Franklinia genes and traits. Now a lot of what makes up an organism is the combination, the specific combination of those genes. Uh, but in this particular case, molecular tools have really helped people like me or plant breeders understand relationships about what maybe I would go breed with. And so Franklinia is towards the bottom. There we go. And the Shim is at the top and the Shimlinia hybrid is in the middle. So it turns out that Franklinia, its closest relatives were the evergreen Shima of Southeast Asia. Uh, that's sort of most of the story of Arnold. A good portion of, of Arnold is the study of these biogeographical relationships, how these floras have been uh, connected uh, over time and, and the relationships be between these plants. And so uh, if you look on this tree, uh, Franklinia is, um, and so we use that um, to breed and see, well, well, for that, that's a real selfish reason. What, can we get a better ornamental out of it? So Franklinia on your left, Shima on the right, and then the Shimlinia hybrid in the middle. So that's a bi-generic hybrid. Um, and uh, so in some ways, we've captured some of those Franklinia genes. Uh, and here's the hybrid uh, in the fields in North Carolina. This is Tom Ranney's breeding program. Uh, and um, it's a pretty cool plant. 
Unfortunately, there is a sterility bottleneck. So from a breeding standpoint, we haven't been able to get to the, the next generation when the, all the recombination really occurs. Uh, but he's, he's still working on it. And uh, uh, so from a horticultural point of view, we take advantage of this diversity. But it's just something to think about whether, you know, if at the end of the day you couldn't save the species in a pure form, isn't it better to have something of it? And uh, that's sort of a philosophical debate, I think. But this is actually another wide hybrid that Tom Rainey did. This is actually a hybrid between Frank Linnea and Gordonia, which is uh, also native, is actually native to the southeastern United States in the same family. He calls this one sweet tea uh, because we are from Carolina. Um, and we do put sugar and things down there. I know you don't do that uh, up here. Um, but uh, that's another great ornamental. And it's actually pretty hardy. Gordonia is about his own sevens. Uh, and so a lot of what we do uh, is cons conserve and collect this diversity. So maybe some of you have heard about this bald seed vault off of Norway in the Arctic Circle. Um, and it really is, so that's a doomsday vault. That, that, in, that is intended to capture as much of the needed diversity of plant material on the planet that we need to survive. Uh, and the United States Department of Agriculture has been the largest supplier of uh, seed to that uh, vault around the world. So, you know, our, our national plant germplasm system is the largest in the world, uh, and we are the largest. Uh, but that, that supply is only intended to be used if all hell breaks loose. Uh, and actually, it has recently been used um, to supply Syria with some of their adapted wheat varieties because of the, the prolonged nature of the Syri Syrian conflict. So they actually ran out in their research fields uh, and their supplies. And so they actually uh, withdrew some of their seed. But anyways, the premise is based on conserving and the fact that we have a lot of seed um, that you can store for a long time. And I thought this was interesting that, uh, um, that they've been looking underneath the glaciers as they retreat around the world and looking at the soil uh, profile and looking for seeds and then trying to germinate uh, to see what they can come up with. And uh, uh, in 2012, they germinated a uh, silene um, that hadn't seen the light of day in 30,000 years. And so it's actually uh, pretty much the precursor of the, the modern species in that area. So it's pretty interesting to think that when you consider what's native and what's con conserving, is you now have sort of resurrected a species that doesn't really exist. Uh, and this is what you know, gets me excited. It gets people like Michael Dozman and, and Nicole and Ned excited is the, the potential in, in the seed and, and what it means. And uh, I'm a plant breeder and so I'm always looking at combination of traits and these are uh, horse chestnuts. Um, and this is, at the end of the day for me, it's real important because uh, the bottom, um, but in the bottom left is Aeschylus uh, uh, hippocastinum and then the top um, and the, no, the, 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 the right is Aeschylus turbinata, the Japanese horse chestnut, and the European horse chestnut. You guys have seen European horse chestnut probably throughout Boston for the last 150, 200 years. Uh, but horse chestnut, the European one, it has a number of diseases, the foliar diseases that really um, defoliate it and causes problems, where the, the Japanese horse chestnut on the right is essentially clean. Uh, and up in the top left is the F1 hybrid between them that happens a lot in uh, spontaneously in cultivation. Now, if you're conserving species, you'd be concerned about that. But then I wear my horticulture hat and say, well, this is great because this is a, this is a chance to be a better plant for our urban landscapes. And we have to have livable communities. Uh, and so it's a justification. And so now when I normally give this talk, I'm talking to places around the country that don't understand what an arboretum is. Uh, this is Highland Park uh, in Rochester. <coughs> great example of a tree collection. Uh, and, and then this is the Arnold Arboretum. Uh, and this is a great example of a tree collection. And for a lot of people, and I was out there today, there are people that go through that collection, picnic in that collection, and don't know what they're looking at other than their nice trees. And that's okay. You can't reach everyone, but that's a start. Then there's gonna be people who go through that collection and say, those are nice red oaks, or black oaks, uh, or white oaks. And then there are going to be people like me who say, wow, that's a, that's a um, Quercus uh, illicina, and uh, I haven't seen one of those, or Elisifolia in a while. Um, and so collections have layers of information. But my point here is that it's not mutually exclusive. They have beautiful places that have a lot of value on a number of, of levels. Uh, and it's unfortunate because uh, we do deal with botanical gardens that do have gates and do have to worry about membership constantly and do have to worry about how to bring in people so that we can have financial uh, sustainability. We have this at the National Arboretum as well. We don't have a gate, but we're tied to the federal budget process, and, 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 and that's pretty much where we're tied. And so 
Um, so you were always looking at how you can stretch dollars further or get more dollars. Uh, and the problem is that you, you often get away from what we're really about, which is about the plants. But there are hooks, there are hooks. Uh, and of course, we like to talk about dinosaurs and living fossils. Uh, and uh, certainly, you have a great collection of ginkgo here, which is a prime example of a living fossil, an early uh, divergent gymnosperm that has pretty much remained unchanged for 120 plus million years. Uh, and that's an amazing story to tell, that we are literally looking at not a stuffed dinosaur or a recreation of a dinosaur, but something that was literally essentially around uh, when the dinosaurs were here. Now that doesn't mean it hasn't changed, uh, and I know some people don't like the idea of a living fossil because things do change, but Don Redwood, of course, and you all heard his story here at Arnold Arboretum, uh, we can thank for bringing the world this great and wonderful tree, Metasequoia glyptus triboides, the Don Redwood, uh, and here's our grove of some of the original seed that, that the Arnold Arboretum distributed uh, in 1948 ish. Um, and so, you know, they certainly have their, their uh, appeal. Uh, and if you, if you are in the plant world and paid attention, there was one that in the last two decades that really took everybody by storm. And this is the Willemi pine. How many people have heard of the Willemi pine story from Australia? So uh, if I get it right, essentially a park ranger was exploring a, one of the canyons there and stumbled upon a tree he couldn't identify. Uh, and then when they, when they got it identified, I'm really paraphrasing the story, it was like you basically found another living fossil. Uh, and so this is Willemi nobilis, which was uh, again a primitive gymnosperm um, in the Oricaria group, if I remember correctly. And what's interesting about this was you had this, again, you think we know it all, right? We think we've discovered everything there is to discover. How did this large conifer, this, this, uh, conifer uh, evade detection uh, since we've been botanizing in Australia? That's pretty amazing. It wasn't like this little filmy liverwort underneath a rock. It was a large trees in a canyon. Uh, and literally, it's another one uh, of the of living fossils. And what was interesting was, the Australia totally controlled the distribution of that plant so they could raise money for conservation. It was the first time ever that essentially an entire species was pa not patented but protected uh, with, legisl with, uh, with legal rights essentially. Uh, and the only people that could sell or offer was the, the authorized by um, the folks in Australia. And so that's a, that's a pretty amazing story to think of what we got that, that we instantly sort of applied that sort of uh, how are we going to raise money to conserve this? Uh, and, uh, and, and we've had some. I don't know. Have you killed it here? If you've tried it? Um, it, it persists. This is here in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, it can live for a little while, but uh, it, it, it basically turns brown eventually. But it's, a little, it's pretty tough, actually. It's pretty fun to experiment with. We've also experimented with other dinosaur-like plants, oricarias. There's a, uh, this is the famous uh, Chilean monkey puzzle uh, tree or pine. I showed a picture of it with the enjoy them like Charles Darwin did from Chile. This is at the National Zoo, uh, but of course it's crispy brown as well. Uh, and if you are into conifers uh, and you haven't been to Atlanta Botanic Garden, you really need to go because they're one of the leaders in, in, uh, in, in conservation of conifers. And the big tree up on the right, uh, tallest tree on the right, is pretty much one of the, the, the toughest oricarias. This is oricaria angustifolia from Brazil, and it's actually a threatened species there as well. And so um, we have a lot of plants that we're trying to protect. Uh, and there's a lot of great stories that you can tie in uh, if you know their backgrounds. And the Arnold Arboretum has been there from day one. Uh, this is Torea, and I think Torea taxifolia has a, a, probably a special place in, in Arnold's heart. heart. Um, this is one of our rarest trees in the United States, grows only in the panhandle of Florida. Um, this is not the panhandle of Florida. This is the national champion growing on a farm in North Carolina that I told myself for two decades I would, I would track down and find. And one day I, I had no, I, my, my kids weren't with me, my dogs weren't with me, it was just me going back to North Carolina, uh, to, to Washington, D.C. And I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get off the road and I'm going to find it. And I went to a little town uh, where, it, was found, where it's, it, it, it grows and I asked at an antique store, I said, do you know there is a famous tree in town. And he said, well, I don't know, but I'll call someone up. And he called someone up, and I heard, um, it turns out that he was the mayor of the small town. And he uh, talked, he made two phone calls, and within two phone calls, I had an invite to the farm. And went straight there. Uh, it's not a very aesthetic tree, uh, but nonetheless, 
um, they have protected this tree for a long time. Uh, and uh, Torea taxifolia, stinking cedar from Florida. There's my buddy uh, Dan Hinckley again as we go to see a population on a cutover in Florida. There it is in the wild. Very few trees remaining, certainly very few sexually mature or, or reproducing trees. Uh, and sometimes, I guess the California species is called the nutmeg. Uh, there's the, uh, it's a, not a conifer, it's a gymnosperm. Um, and uh, it's interesting that there was another large tree. This got handed around. This was like the tree to have in the late 1800s. This was it. This was the first fad. It, before Metasequoia, it was Terea. And all the estates had it. Biltmore Estate had it. Um, and, um, you know, all the wealthy plantations. It got distributed in, in uh, not plantations, but the old farms in, uh, in the south. Anybody who, who pictured themselves as genteel uh, plantsmen, I guess. Um, and the one I went to in Oxford, North Carolina, actually had two trees, a male and a female, and so a lot of the trees, uh, that, those seeds have been provided to the Atlanta Botanic Garden, which I showed earlier, to help conserve it. But it was interesting, the seed was being moved around by squirrels. They were actually burying them like a, like a regular nut. Um, and I thought that was interesting. So they had, literally had Torea popping up all over this old farmstead. Uh, and here we are going through all this effort to try to conserve it. Sometimes you, maybe you do just want to let nature take a hold. Uh, and it's interesting, was Torea native to North Carolina? probably 40,000, 80,000, 180,000 years ago. Uh, and it got stuck in the glacial period in Panhandle of Florida and can never get out. It's one way to look at it, right? Um, and so this Atlanta Botanic Garden has done a lot. And I also on that same trip went to see another one of our rarest uh, species in North America. This is Florida U, Taxus Floridana. So the other thing we have to remember about, sometimes plants are rare uh, because they're not easy to grow. Uh, there's a reason we grow Japanese yew and English yew and the hybrid yews because they grow and they're vigorous and you can transplant them. Not so with, with Florida yew. Uh, it's beautiful nonetheless, but if you're a nurseryman or a landscaper or a designer, you're not going to find it and there's a good reason it doesn't grow. And so horticulture has a very important role uh, in terms of, of conservation because if you don't know how to grow it, uh, then you're not going to be able to distribute it. And just outside in the back here, this is not a conifer talk. Uh, but I'm sort of hung up on them, is uh, the, the famous uh, Cathaya from China, which again is a very rare um, conifer, sort of an uh, important evolutionary link within the pine family. And this only got out of China not more than 20 years ago. I know it was sometime the end of my, uh, grad, uh, my undergraduate in the 90s where some people got very nice gifts that year from a very famous conifer nursery and said, here's your Cathaya, because they were able to get a handful of seed out of China. Uh, and no matter how you feel about how that handful of seed maybe got out of China, uh, was the fact that it's a very important species that was needed for conservation. And sometimes we have them right here in our collections and we don't even realize it. Things change, the target moves. Our collections are not static. You don't plant it and you watch it for 150 years and then tell the same story. The sad thing is things like Glyptostrobus, which is related to Metasequoia and Taxodium, um, the Chinese water pine went f is really uh, heavily used in portions of China, but at the same time, it's functionally extinct in the wild. And that's only recently happened that, uh, here's our plants on the grounds, we have people drive by it as a cut through in our, our arboretum for people to avoid one of the bad intersections in, uh, in D.C. And they drive, they drive by this all the time and don't realize they're looking at one of the world's threatened conifer species. Uh, and it's been uh, listed on the IUCN Red Leak li list as a functionally extinct because it's not reproducing in the wild. There's only a handful of sites. Um, and so again, that is a species that's well on its way to being a, cons uh, a conservation species. Uh, and here we are at the Arnold, um, and magnolias are one of the more threatened group of, of plants. Uh, this is Centennial. This is uh, a plant that was introduced by the Arnold uh, Arboretum in 1972. Um, and very common species in, in landscapes. It's doing quite well right now. I think it mostly avoided some of the frosts out there, maybe not. Um, but again, this species in the wild in Japan is quite threatened. Um, and, uh, but you wouldn't know that when you look at it in cultivation. Uh, but again, the magnolias are one of these, it is our closest thing to a charismatic megaflora, I guess. You know, everyone can get excited about really large flowered magnolias. Uh, but a large portion of them are threatened in the wild uh, with extinction. And so we have a lot of work to do. These are just um, the temperate ones that we can grow. Uh, 
That's a, that's a pretty big list to start with. Um, I don't know, you, you guys have a good number of those here. Um, but uh, the IUCN listed this. Uh, it's a good uh, place to start when you start looking at your conservation plans. And, and we have some of these in our collections. This is Magnolia cylindrica, one of the rare ones. Um, that is a wild collection. Again, why do we explore? Why do we bother at the Arnold or the National and the Morton uh, to go around? Well, because these things are still threatened and they're part of the story that we're still unfolding. Here's another form of cylindrica. Um, and then this one, who, who, who knows what that is? What do you think? It's a big leaf magnolia? Yeah, more or less. It's actually um, the Mexican form, Magnolia diabata, which is highly threatened. And people tend to forget that, you know, the southeastern flora, what we think of as the eastern deciduous woodland, doesn't stop in Texas. It, there's a little bit of a drying out spell that happened in one of the glacial periods or whatever, but it continues into the, the, the highlands of Mexico, and, and it's an important area of diversity as we understand the temperate flora. Uh, this is essentially the same thing as Magnolia macrophylla and Ashii. This picture was taken uh, last time I visited the Arnold Arboretum out in your collection. There's Magnolia macrophylla on top, the big leaf magnolia, and there's Magnolia ashii on the bottom, which is either a subspecies of macrophylla or its own species. But ashii, whatever you call it, is one of our, again, one of our more threatened species. And we're working with that in our uh, repository. Um, and I showed this because uh, it reminds me one time of what J.C. Ralston said about dove tree. Um, he said, uh, if everyone had a dove tree, we would think it was the trashiest plant because when the bracts fell, you would get tired of looking at all that detritus. Uh, I don't know if that's true, you might argue, but I, when you look at magnolia, you think, there's part of me that says, God, what a mess in the landscape. To me, it's beautiful, I love it. And uh, I, everywhere I've gardened, I've always had a couple magnolia, big leaf forms of magnolia, but uh, it, it just, Again, it's a, it's a you know, fickle thing in, in, in fashion and taste, right? Uh, uh, one man's uh, treasure is another man's trash. And so one of the things that we've been working with, obviously, is, is around the world in terms of conservation is we don't even know what we have. We don't even know how many names we have for all these plants. And so the consortium here uh, was trying to figure out, well, how many names of plants do we have? Uh, how do you conserve something if you don't know what you have or what to call it? And if you look at Catalpa, Based on the names on this list, uh, you would think, wow, we've got 20-something species to work with, uh, or 12 species to work with. Well, it turns out um, we didn't have as many as we think, and sometimes diversity goes the other way, and that's not a bad thing. And what do I mean by that? Catalpa tibetica. When I was in a PhD and working on uh, breeding, uh, uh, I was looking at Catalpa because there's an underutilized genus. There's a lot of diversity there. There are about when I started, about 12 species of catalpa. And uh, they're divided between the hardy temperate ones and the uh, subtropical ones that occur in the West Indies. They're uh, semi-evergreen to evergreen and essentially not cultivated. Uh, and one of the things I read about was this, catalpa tibetica. Um, it was collected by forest in, in uh, southwestern Yunnan or in Yunnan. Uh, and it was a creamy yellow flowered shrub-like species occurring at high elevations in China. Wow. I want to use that in catalpa breeding. High elevations in China with, with, with creamy yellow flowers. Uh, and so we had this great information on the type specimen in Edinburgh. Well, the first red flag that went up was that's the only specimen that exists in the world, was the type specimen uh, th that we could find at the time. And so we scoured, we couldn't find anything. Okay, so what's the story on Tibetica? Um, I'll come back to it. But there were other species we were interested in as well. Catalpa bungii, which you guys have one of the oldest plants, the oldest plant actually in the United States, is here on the grounds of the Arnold Arboretum. Well, it was sat there by itself in cultivation for until 1994 when the NACPEG expeditions collected it again. And uh, it's an interesting story. I don't know why it's probably overlooked. Oh, the Catalpa, we don't care about them, or we've got it, or we think we have it. Um, but it really wasn't collected and reintroduced until 1994. Uh, this is a specimen grown at, at the National Arboretum. And Frank Meyer, our famous USDA plant explorer, contemporary with E.H. Wilson, said to him this was one of the most beautiful flowering trees in China. And it is really gorgeous. I'm actually on a bucket truck looking down as we were collecting uh, to do pollinations with because it's a gorgeous, it looks like it has pink flowers, but they're really white with lots of little pink and purple dots. So it's like a pointillist painting. Um, so it's really white with dots. And so we came up here. Uh, to Arnold Arboretum to study the collections. We went over to Cambridge to study uh, Arnold's uh, 
uh, wild collected specimens in the herbaria over there to try to figure out what was going on. This is my colleague, Joe Kirkbride, uh, and we stumbled upon a, a later collection of Frank Meyer that was lost in cultivation, that there was a seed had been received by the USDA, and um, uh, somehow you guys had specimens here. Um, and, and ultimately, that led us back to China. Why do we still go back to China? Well, we don't know at all. Yes, there are 30,000 species of plants. Uh, and so we went, and this is, uh, as again, as a person that loves plant exploration, it was amazing to finally go to China. And I'm sure you've heard this a lot of time. But for me, uh, to go to Kangshan, which is a, one of the great uh, hot spots in Yunnan, was pretty amazing. And look up from the uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. And we met with our colleagues. And this is a small world now, right? We, we, we get to meet. Uh, so Kong Wong, who's worked with NACPEC and uh, folks in this room for a long time, uh, is on the left. Soon Wei Bang, who's the, who's the director of um, Kunming, uh, we're discussing where to go, where to find these plants. And we were looking at the herbarium specimens, and he was providing uh, information. Uh, we did uh, three different, herb we visited three different herbaria while we were there. We did, our plant exploration was essentially limited to herbaria. We, we were kind of the weird people. We, we didn't really go into the field that much. Uh, but we started in the, in the herbaria. This was in Beijing, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And in three herbaria, we looked at 600, more, we, well, more than 600 specimens, but we corrected the identity on 600 herbarium sheets while we were there. And the reason I say that is I think we were the first Westerners or people to study Catalpa in China. Um, because it really dawned on me that I didn't realize it at the time was that we went and explored China for the last 150 years, and we would go there as, 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 as uh, the explorers, and we would collect, and where would we go? Home. And then we would do all the science at home. And we had all the material in our institutes. Uh, and so the Chinese didn't really have access to all those type specimens and all of that research. And they did a lot of regurgitation of what somebody did before them. And it's like that telephone game where you, know, you, you tell a kid a message and then 20 kids later you, you find out what the message is. That's sort of what happens when you can't go back. And that's why herbaria is so important. The type specimen does not lie. It does not change. You can go back to it and say, now, what is Catalpa tabatica? Let's go all the way back and look at it. Uh, and we did that with Catalpa bungii and Fargesii. We just submitted the paper to Britonia. And we found out a couple things. Actually, this one was published prior. Catalpa tibetica was nothing but naturalized Catalpa bignonioides, or maybe it's hybrid with, with Catalpa ovata. Why is this important? We found a lot of specimens when we were there of introduction. And you have to remember that China has been a country for 2,000 years at least. Plants go both ways. We tend to think of just going to China to collect. But remember, Marco Polo, Silk Roads, the horse and sugar trails, plants are going back and forth. Catalpa bignoniotes was one of the first plants to really get moved around the world after it was discovered by Mark Catesby. Uh, and so we looked at all those specimens. And so, um, and Bungii, the paper we just submitted, is um, basically says there's only Bungii, there's no Fargesia. And I think we've talked about that with Ned. But this is what we do at the National Arboretum, um, is we look at all these gene pools. Um, so, but this is, I, I mentioned this briefly in the beginning, this is a lot of what we, how we approach it at the National Arboretum because we're delivering um, plants to the American nursery industry, essentially, is one, one thing that we do. Um, we need to know what diversity exists in cultivation, what exists out in the wild, uh, do we know how to identify it, um, do we know where they're from, what are the provenances, what are the cultivars, uh, do we know if we had the proper name, uh, that's all the sort of research we can do. Uh, and then as a breeder, I want to know who's it related to and what, what can I use to enhance that gene pool? Uh, what can I cross it with and how do they cross? And then what are we trying to improve for? Well, we're trying to improve for hardiness, form, color. Uh, more often than not nowadays, we're trying to select for reduced fertility. I dare say sterility, but you know, in biology, we don't like to deal with absolutes. So reduced fertility would be great. Um, and then uh, maybe looking at uh, different breeding systems and inheritance. So those are all things that we study. And when I first got to the Arboretum, one of the things that I was really interested in was um, Kynanthus retusus, Chinese fringe tree. Uh, it's a really great plant, and the Arnold Arboretum has a number of specimens. Um, this particular one is one that's grown at the National Arboretum, and this is what I knew growing up in the South as uh, the southern form of Kynanthus retusus. But prior to this study, we never looked into where it came from. Uh, and then 
there was some talk about it coming from Taiwan in the early literature, um, but there was nothing connecting the two. And so, um, in, in this particular case, it was like, well, we know it's a good species, there's not really anything wrong with it, but where would I go as a plant collector to get more? Because maybe we don't know everything we think we know about Kynanthus retusis if this is a limited gene pool. Maybe our knowledge of Kynanthus retusis is limited, uh, so let's go out and see if there's other places we can collect and see if we're only scratching the surface on the diversity in Kynanthus retusis. And so there's my uh, buddy, Ky uh, Joe Kirkwright. I always joke that, um, well, he is out in the field as a taxonomist, but uh, a lot of taxonomists I met do look like this, uh, so they do need to get out and get sunshine every once in a while and not look at dead plants. But he was a great colleague. We traveled the world together, and he just recently retired, and I miss him tremendously. Uh, this is down in Texas. So I say this southern form, this is important, this does really well in Texas, round leaves, really lustrous, shiny, um, not at all like the form that you have on top of um, Bussy, which is uh, from Japan, and was the first introduction to the United States. Uh, and then we had this thing, which came uh, from, in our garden, which I really liked, it had leaves like this, which was more like Kynanthus virginicus, our native fringe tree. Uh, and all we had was that it came as index semina, semina from Kunming. Extremely vase-shaped habit, uh, pretty decent yellow fall color for a Kynanthus. Uh, and uh, this is a male form, so I don't have to worry about fruit. Very much unlike what, what I was used to. And so you look into, well, where is Kynanthus from? What's available? Well, in red is the, is the outline of its range in uh, Eastern Asia. You see one spot uh, in Japan. You see the two islands between Japan and Korea, and then Taiwan, and then that sort of circuitous uh, range there in China. And then I thought, well, where, where are these plants coming from? Well, this is the type spe uh, specimen uh, in England, uh, which we annotated, by the way. It was never annotated, so it's amazing. You think everything's been done. Um, but this was the, the fortune specimen that was collected around 1850, and it came from where the red star is. And then this is the next one, which was the uh, Veach collection. Uh, by Charles Maurice in 1879. And then this is the Arnold one. Now, I, it's important to note that the uh, fortune specimens were lost, that that was considered lost to cultivation. It was not successively introduced. And then the Veach one uh, was unknown. It was surely thought to be in England, uh, but it was unknown. And then you have the Arnold one in 1901 from Tokyo. Uh, and then Frank Meyer, our collector, collected it uh, in 1907, and, and that's about as close as I can get with that question mark. Uh, and so, as you can see, that's not a lot of the range uh, that we had supposedly in cultivation. And where did some of our plants come from? We weren't sure what we had. And so we did, you know, the, the CIS thing uh, and, and looked at genetic markers. Um, and this is not a family tree. You should never call it a family tree, but this is a, a base... Uh, uh, all the samples we tested based on their sort of genetic relationships, how closely related were they. And so we, seen, we saw these clusters. And the first one I'll start with is Arnold's Promise. That's what it is, just like the Hamamelis. Um, uh, and this is it. That's the Tokyo 1901. And all those accessions there are things that were either thought to have been derived in the records or in the records were definitely derived from the original tree. Some of those are seedlings that came off of it. Uh, some of those are commercial forms in New England, so it's de probable that seed or something was collected or off of those um, seeds. So that, that was definitely the northern form of Kynanthus. Now this is the southern form, and the name that was put on that by Don Shadow is China Snow. Well, this is why we have plant records and uh, like, uh, um, institutes like the Arnold that go back 150 years, because I was, once we started putting the details together and we got into our own records, we could see that I needed more information from Michael. And so we were able to look at the dead accessions and accessions that had been distributed from here that Arnold no longer had, and we were able to piece it together. And that the Arnold, guess what, introduced this as well. Uh, in 1931, uh, there was a professor in Taiwan that sent seeds to uh, Arnold, and then it got distributed. And there's reasons it's a southern form. It didn't survive uh, in your area. And this is the important thing about distributing, distributing plants. Don't hold on to them. Uh, and so these are the ones that I grew up with in the South. And then there's this, which is very interesting. Um, this is a, a, a collection, went to Highland Park, and I talked to their curator, and he says, oh, no, we, we still have plants, but they only have a card index file of their plants. Uh, small garden run by the county now, even though it's a historic. And so we were able to go through there, and lo and behold, they still had plants from the Veach expedition that they accessioned. 
Uh, and Arnold had them at, at, at one point as well, but yours, uh, you had lost them at some point. But now we were able to uncover uh, through sleuthing and that uh, some of the original Veatch material was still around in cultivation. And then what's interesting is all the modern stuff that's in commercial introduction in the United States is derived, uh, a little bit derived from Meyer, but a lot of it is seed that's coming directly from China now from the similar part of China, which is interesting. So I'm not saying that the USDA is responsible, but the Chinese material that's coming over uh, uh, clusters with the, uh, the Meyer stuff that was collected. And so that sort of helps tell where would we go for things that um, we don't have. And what's interesting is there's a fastidious cultivar called Tokyo Tower, which is really cool. Uh, and it's interesting that it clusters with a very small endemic population on Tashima Island. And so, again, you don't have to just have wild collected material, maybe, to justify plants, but sometimes cultivated material is derived from wild material, uh, and there's information and value there. Uh, and this was the really confusing thing. The stuff that the Arnold Arboretum and the National Arboretum have collected in Korea clusters with the stuff that we got in Index Semina from Kunming. Uh, Part of the, the theme, if you haven't sensed it, was how important the records are on the diversity. It's one thing to have a, a, a trophy case and say, here's this species, here's this species, here's this, this is great. But then you're not much different than any collector or any landscape. It's really the information you have with that material. And we spend an inordinate amount of, of uh, time and money on keeping records, and it's for very good reason. These are the original PI books. These are the plant introductions in the United States run through the USDA since 1896. Uh, and we have those records in, in the National Arboretum. Um, they're now encapsulated in the Germplasm Resource Information Network, which is available to all of you online. Um, and so it's a, it's a collective wealth of information. And so plant records are really important. So this is right outside this building. Uh, this is a Stewardia Studio Camellia. But in the background is a nice orange globe of fall color. This was last time I was here. Um, and a lot of our information is in the background. And until you start peeling it and, and looking at it, you'll never know sort of the stories and what we can do to promote conservation and talk about diversity. This is Fothergilla Major. Fothergilla Major, the mountain witch alder. Um, and what's interesting, when I look at that, I, 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 I'm a weird person. Uh, when I look at that, I think of weavers work on Hamelodacea and Fothergilla, which told me that that species is a hexaploid and that Gardenia is a, um, a uh, tetraploid. Uh, and you look at the tag and the tag says lineage, Biltmore Nurseries. Now isn't that interesting? Who would have thought that um, that plant was derived from some accessions that came, this is actually another plant up the hill, but you, you, you have a series of these Fothergilla that came from Biltmore. Well, Biltmore was an interesting place. It was one of the few privately funded botanical um, institutes in the country. Uh, Olmsted, uh, not Olmsted, Vanderbilt was funding out of his pocket um, Olmsted's uh, wishes to have a great arboretum and botanical legacy uh, for Vanderbilt in North Carolina. And, and th there's a number of staff on there. Boynton was one of them. Uh, Chauncey Beadle is talking uh, to Michael as someone. And they went around and collected really cool plants. They had a herbarium, a 100,000 sheet herbarium at Biltmore. It was flooded out in 1916, and those specimens I found out went to the Smithsonian. Only about 25,000 were salvaged. But what's interesting is that Biltmore, they were working with Sargent. You know, Sargent was infecting everybody back then. You had to have, if you were wealthy and had money, you had to have an arboretum. Uh, and if you had Olmsted designing it, even better. Uh, and so when Olmsted Jr. was going to his, uh, to the Biltmore estate with uh, Boynton, uh, the horticulturist and uh, botanist for, private horticulturists and botanists for uh, Biltmore, they stopped off to recollect a plant that was, had only been described but hadn't been seen uh, since the early uh, 1800 by uh, uh, Andre Michaud or Francois Michaud. I, I can't remember which one. This is Rus Pumala, which is what Michaud knew, knew it as. But when Sargent received the specimens from Chauncey Beadle and said, you may want to know about this and publish it, he published it in about 1895 or 97 in Garden and Forest as um, Rus Michaudii in honor of Michaud. And there's a reason uh, taxonomically why he had to use a new name. But this is a federally endangered plant in the United States. It's only known from a handful of populations. A lot of them have been extirpate, uh, uh, destroyed by road, um, uh, new roads and the lack of burning and, and, and uh, pine forests. Um, and the other problem, male and female populations. It's a stolen asexual. Uh, it spreads asexually. 
uh, and so it's not reproducing. And so there's all these amazing stories when you get into it that we can tie into conservation. And I've mentioned Fatha Gill, I don't have time to go into that, but I'll leave you with this um, because I think this is just crazy. It ties it all in. E.H. Wilson, e. Chinese Wil uh, Wilson, who was here at the Arboretum and was collecting, uh, pretty much considered one of the greatest plant explorers ever. You all know the story. Uh, and here is this plant at the J.C. Rawlson Arboretum named Cornus Wilsoniana. One, named after someone very famous. Two, gorgeous exfoliating bark like a sycamore when it's young. Uh, has small little clusters of white flowers. It's not one of the big bracted dogwoods like our native flowering dogwood. It's more of a, one of the cymos species, I guess. Um, but nonetheless, how did this really gorgeous plant elude us um, for so long with a prominent name? Um, part of it is because it's probably not hardy at Arnold Arboretum where Wilson was. Uh, who knows what happened with the distribution? Uh, surely it wasn't overlooked because when I first went to China, I went to find this plant. I thought, I'm going to find this plant because uh, I think it, it's, it's a great plant for Zone 7 gardens. Looked all over. Long story short, uh, this is a grove of that species growing in Nanjing at the Ming tomb. Turns out, besides having gorgeous bark when it's older, these are, there are some plants at Chen Shen, uh, or Chen Shan, Chen Shan uh, is this plant was planted at the Ming tomb because it's been used as an oil crop in China for a thousand years. Oil. It's a dog, its seed actually produces a, a, a valuable oil. We think we know it all, uh, but we don't. Uh, and whatever it takes to get kids excited, I guess. So thank you for, for bearing with me. Now, when I say macroevolution, I mean the big picture evolution. That means that before there were primates, there were other things. There, there was a time when dinosaurs, as we know them as large organisms, went extinct. Of course, we know that dinosaurs didn't go extinct. We just have birds now that are flying around that are small. But the bottom line is we can look at these things and you can say, well, this happened at such and such a time. It looked like this. But very little of this is about how evolution works. The process, the ongoing day-to-day -day changes in organisms and their biology that create the large pictures and patterns that you see exhibited in so many wonderful natural history museums.